Hey there, friends and running fans. This is Ambi Burfoot with George Hirsch at the podcast Running State of the Sport. We've got a short podcast today. We won't have an intro or outro, but we're looking forward to a tremendous conversation with Meb Kefleski, who is himself running the Boston Marathon in just a few days on April 15th. Hey, Meb. It's always an honor and a joy to have you with us. So thanks for thanks for coming on. Hey, Ambie. Hey, George. It's such a great honor to be with you guys. It's been uh, so fun to listen to your podcast, Running State of the Sport. I'm a big fan of you guys for many years. So thanks for having me today. Meb, you've won an Olympic marathon medal, New York City Marathon. The very famous 2014 running of the Boston Marathon in a year after the bomb explosions, and a whole lot more. But we're not going to be able to cover all of that turf right now. But you've been a big part of the fabric of American running for so long, more than more than two decades now, that some listeners might have forgotten a few personal details. So give us the basic bio, your age where you're living now, your family situation, and, you know, what you spend most of your daily hours doing. Well, George, it's a a great honor to be with you guys. I am 48 years old, 49, soon to be in May. Uh, I am in Tampa, Florida, where my wife grew up and raising our three daughters here. You know, if you can believe it, many people have followed me over the years. Sarah, my oldest, just turned. 18 and she's going to graduate this year so for those people that were there on her first birthday celebration or seen her through some road races back in 2006 and 2007 she's turning 18 going to college and uh yeah most of my time is spent now i've uh, been an ambassador for the sport but a lot of time especially the last two three years has been on the med foundation maintaining excellent balance through health education and fitness to empower youth through sports and uh it's such a delight because that's how my running started. So to be able to be in position to give back is just an awesome feeling. And I feel very, very blessed. I could never have depicted this in my running life that this would be something that I would do or be where I am. But I've been you know, student of the sport for so long. And to be in position now to give back, I feel so grateful. I still can't believe you're 48. I think you're 25 and living in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that update. You know, one of the new things you're doing that George and I, of course, are very interested in in, is the podcast that you do with New York Roadrunner CEO Rob Simulcare. Uh, It's called Set uh, Set the Pace. And Rob's a real media veteran, and you're a veteran runner, but kind of new to the media world. And yet you really make big contributions to that podcast. You ask great questions. And you make great observations on the people who are with you. How have, how have you enjoyed doing that podcast? It's such a big uh, big and fun to do something. And I was so timid to be on TV or hear my voice and things like that. But on Set the Pace with Rob Simicare, Rob is just an amazing individual who has so many backgrounds to make it come all alive. I'm just at his co-host to be able to share stories of what, people are up to, what obstacles they have overcome. We have interviewed some amazing, amazing stories on how to overcome adversity and challenges. And for me, that's where I add up a little bit on it because the situations of my upbringing and the situations that I have encountered through running a marathon, the ups and downs of marathoning and life. And uh, he brings his journalism, his business entrepreneurs and you know, such a delight to be able to share this uh, microphone with him and share such a great stories for people to share their story. We all have our stories, thousands, millions of people. It's just wonderful to be able to just put a spotlight on some individuals. Well, I find that you really do a great job at helping those people express the emotions of their running because, of course, you've been through so many emotions up and down over a long career, and you know what it's like. So it seems like this year you're running the Boston Marathon again, which is very exciting. I'm not sure if it's the first time since 2014 or not. So why don't you tell us and why are you running and what are your goals and what's the purpose for this year's effort? Amy and George, I I thought about uh, 
retired for many, many years from my marathons, but I retired officially in 2017 at the TCS New York City Marathon. And I thought it was going to be a long time before I tried to come back, but I always understood the value of charity, understood the value of exercise, the value of having exercise as a daily routine. It's still in my blood. So when I got a call from uh, uh, Bill Richards, Martin Richards' dad, or uh, got an email from him and he said, hey, we're considering doing uh, the MR8, his foundation. Can you run for him in 2018? And honestly, at that time, I wasn't thinking another marathon. I was just saying, I signed up too much for the TCS New York City Marathon. I was trying to close that chapter. But then I was felt so honored that he emailed me and wanted me to run for his son. And I just delightedly did that in 2018, that bad weather at Boston Marathon. And first at the beginning, I'm like, I'm glad I didn't have to do the strides. I'm glad I didn't have to do uh, the warm ups and things like that. But it was brutal for everybody. So to finish that race, it was great. I ran with um, Patrick Beverly, my good friend. And then that fall, the same thing for Team for Kids. I ran for them uh, to pace Dan, uh, chef, the famous chef Daniel Holm to be able to fundraise and for the Team for Kids. Such they do a great job in New York for runners to give back to underprivileged kids and sports in general for running. So I decided to do that, and then I'm like, so well, I got to do for them my foundation. Uh, and it's been ten years since I won the Boston Marathon. I thought it would be a, a good gesture for me to run the Boston Marathon on my ten year anniversary to celebrate, but also bring attention to the MEV Foundation, maintain excellent balance their health, education, and fitness. It was such a, on the bucket list, and I'm not getting younger, so in a few weeks, I'm going to be 49, so I'm like, you know what, I got to get that on my list, and perfect perfectly well. You know, I was so honored to be able to be invited by the WCVB and ESPN to do the broadcasting again this year, but I decided, you know, it was a tough decision not to be on the podium, but I decided, you know, run them 26.2 miles from Hopkins to Boston or run on the, talk about running on the broadcasting, but it, they understood that I, this year was pretty special for me and to be, to be able to go there. And my goal is to bring attention to the Foundation, help fundraise, and also there'll be 15 other runners that are running for the Met Foundation and, you know, celebrate the, my win, but also at the same time, uh, the Met Foundation, we're going to do a brunch for them on the fifth on the thirteenth of Saturday before the Boston Marathon. So it's just wonderful to be able to lace the shoes up and uh, you know, those four six miles a day that you do it as a habit, they're great. But when you put sign up for a marathon, you gotta respect the distance, you gotta respect the course. And I feel mentally I'm good, but physically isn't my body gonna make it, and I hope to run around three hours is my goal. Well, Meb, I hope those people at ESPN and others find you out in Hopkins and at the start line. I'm sure they'll want to hear about your memories and uh, what you're doing this year there. So let's go all the way back to your beginnings in running. Uh, with your family background, I'm just going to guess that your family was a big soccer fan family or soccer playing. And yet, that's not what you ended up doing. So how did you become a runner? So from humble beginning of Eritrea, where my dad has to walk over 225 miles to save his life from the war-torn country of Eritrea, conflicts with Ethiopia. You know, he was leaving behind a wife and also five kids that were born and then one on the way. And then my parents just made a promise to each other, if, big if, if I make it a safe land, I'll look after you guys. And it took him seven days. And... He lived in Sudan for a year and a half, and I was five years old when he left. I didn't see my father until I was 10 years old. So it was a pretty tough situation, but my mom, God bless her, she was the husband and the wife, and be able to do all the household, be able to plant crops, you know, cut them and separate the hay from the seed and things like that. So it was very torture and hard work that she has to deal with. But, you know, when we made it to Italy due to my dad's boss, Dr. Brindici, who, you know, my dad asked him if he could loan him 10 million lira to save his uh, wife and kids. And he said, is that to save one, just one person or to save everybody? And my dad goes, with that money that I have uh, collected, it would save everybody. So Dr. Brindici gave him uh, 10 million lira cash. And he said, this is not a loan, it's a gift. And that's how we got saved. And left to Michael, my sister's mom, half sister mom, was instrumental to that. So when I went to Italy, all we played was soccer, and then, you know, in Eritrea, we would make shift soccer. We didn't have shoes, so we made a so long socks or a long island sleeve shirt with stuffed plastic in it so it can bounce. So that's how we all started. And then 
I remember in Italy, we, you know, my dad would call, tell us about Pelé, how he got discovered. And his big dream was to take his kids to the soccer fields and play. And, you know, and as it goes on, when we came to the United States on October 21st, 1987, I feel like it was yesterday, by nearly by Morley Field, where the Fort Locker Cross Country Championship held, we were half a mile away. And we would dribble the soccer ball and we would go to the park and then we see people running. I'm like, what are those people running from? They have nothing to chase. <laughs> So that was kind of what we were introduced to running. And then my two oldest brother, Futsum and Aklilu, were running at Roosevelt Junior High next to the San Diego Zoo in San Diego. And they had a T-shirt that says Roosevelt Junior High Mile Club T-shirt. And I wanted that shirt. And to get that T-shirt as a seventh grader a year later after we've been in the United States was you have to run 6.15 for the boys and eight minutes for the girls. And the coach Duke Lord, the PE teacher, said, if you run hard, you're going to get A. If you mess around, you're going to get DRF. And I, I ran as hard as I could to get that T-shirt. And I, to his surprise and mine, I ran a 520 mile. Nice. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, you're going to go to the Olympics and all that stuff. But all I could add signal was, did I get an A T-shirt and things like that? And it was in the hindsight now, that was 1988. It was an Olympic year, but we were not exposed to sports. That's, and uh, that's how my running started, I feel. You know, that's why I think even with the Met Foundation now to go back full circle to give back to young kids is such an important uh, part of my journey. So who who were outside your your father, or older brother? Who were your mentors or supporters during those uh, really important early years, and what did they contribute to your life and and to your running? George, I had so many important people um, to grow in my life so in many stages. And also, by the beginning, it was that Dr. Steve Van Camp and Gail Van Camp, they were, uh, their daughters were on the team of cross country, and they kind of embraced me around their shoulder and said, hey, come, you know, he, they asked my parents if they can take me on the weekends home on Sundays usually to help me with my English or use the computers and things like that. And they, to this day, they're so mother, father figure, and I still give in touch with them. And uh, they see me grow from little nine years old, I mean, uh, ninth grader all the way to UCLA and then beyond. But there have been so many other coaches like Coach uh, Duke Lord, my seventh grade PE teacher, um, Coach uh, Ed Ramos, uh, Ron Tapp, who you guys know the name probably from the marathon in world. He was on the side, helped me when I was a sophomore, after my sophomore year. And then uh, Coach Bob Larson, Coach Joe V. Hills, they were all instrumental. They all taught me how don't take things for granted, but also work hard and those opportunities and do it for the better of others because we all train hard, work hard. But at the end of the day, uh, for me, running was a gift and it was a lot easier for me, whereas for others, it was not. And, uh, you know, I felt very fortunate to be able to just, uh, you know, shine the moment. But at the end of the day, it takes a village to raise a child. And definitely there have been so many other people in my life that have touched me in many ways and teachers and coaches as well. Well, you know, Meb, it, it turns out that that first uh, PE teacher who saw you run a 520 mile and said, hey, you're going to the Olympics. He was on, he was right on the money. You made it to the Olympics. I believe your first one was in 2000. I'm wondering what it was like to go from being not too many years earlier, a, a kid in Eritrea and Italy, and now you're at the Olympic Games with a USA jersey on. What's that like? Maybe your what you said earlier, my 25 year old in San Diego. That's when how old I was in 2000 and making the Olympic team. I became a U.S. citizen in 1990, July 2nd, 1998, and then graduated from UCLA in 1999. And then after that. People always said, you're going to be a beautiful runner. You're going to be a marathoner. But I'm like, how far is that? And as soon as they told me 26.2 miles, I said, no way. I'm a, I'm a miler. I'm a miler. For as long as I can, I try to be a miler. And to your question, to wear red, white, and blue at the Sydney Olympics in 2000 prior to 9-11, it was magnificent. It was just a, my favorite Olympic to this day in terms of experience. Yes. Because as long as you show me the USA badge, you can go anywhere and have access to do great things. And it was just a lot of, and a lot of freedom, a lot of pride to wear USA jersey on the train, on the boat, on all that stuff. Whereas after 9-11, a lot of things changed. But to go back to that 10K race, I remember my dad was so happy to see me there. He says, this is the American dream come true. You're going to win the gold medal today. And I'm like, dad, first, I had the prelim. Two, I had the flu that was going around. And I said, I can't do it today. He's like, don't think pessimistic. You got to think positive and you got to be able to do it. I'm like, dad, 
Heidegger Rislas hey Paul Turga they run into I have not broken 28 minutes yet so I tell them I hope I don't get laughed and he just kind of got a little upset but I'm like I hope to beat him in the future so after the flu and the prelim I finished 12th place uh I was happy but before I left at that stadium I wanted to do something great for our country I really want to win a medal and when I made that mental goal it was more than 10k because I haven't done a marathon yet so I was pretty excited to be able to come back in four years trying to win a medal hey you know uh but then I came back uh finally started doing altitude training I started doing that you know broke the American record in 20 2001 27 13 and then I knew I was sold to be able I was on this earth to have purpose running and to be altitude training I want to compete against the best in the world and that's what I try to do for the rest of my career so, Matt, tell us about that race, the one that you did win that silver medal in Athens. And to, what was the moment in the race when you realized you were going to be a medal winner? Tell us about that feeling. And what did you do right? You mentioned your training. Also, the race strategy that you took into the race that day. You no, know, preparing for the 2004 Olympic Games, you know, Dina Kasser, myself, Joe Vigo and Coach Bob Larson, we had a goal and started in 2001 to be in Mammoth Lakes and train to help with the resurgence of U.S. distance runner. They had the vision and after a very disappointing finish and the, both the men and women, the uh, marathon in Sydney, they wanted to do something better and to be able to go back to Athens Olympics, you know, I had the great fortune to win uh, the trials and the 10K and I was runner up to Culpepper in the marathon and Dan Brown was a third person finisher in the marathon. So I was like, you know, 10K marathon, first event, two weeks vacation, 20, uh, 26.2 miles, six miles. So the chances of that was more for me to do the 10K, but I really understood the value of marathoning. I understand the history of the marathoning and uh, to be the Olympics in in Greece. It was just, you know, amazing. And to be able to you know, have put in a seminar when Dina won the bronze medal, I was convinced that our training wasn't the right plan, path. And Coach Jovijo and Coach Larson did the right training, heels and humidity training. And the sports science unit and I said Olympic Committee gave us how to execute a good plan in the hot, humid, hilly course. And the race unfolded slowly, but surely finished strong. Don't make so many drastic in terms of training, we put in the work, you know, about 130 miles a week, 136 miles a week. And then there was one convincing time in my training that said, you know, my good friend Mario Arce was on the bike. I was probably one of the few people that I started having a bike pacer on uh, in training. They can see in early in 2001 and 2004. He says, I remember Pastor guys not doing this workout because we were doing two mile repeats at 9,000 feet. And then another workout that I did was, under five minute, fifteen mile tempo at seven thousand with heels, and he says, "There's no way somebody's training harder." And it didn't. And I worked hard and executed a great plan. I remember I seen Coach Larson about fifteen k into it. I gave him thumbs up, and you know. And then there was a little bit of incident with the the Lima and an incident that happened. I didn't see it, but that was a kind of eye opener in terms of safety and things like that. But to be able to finish the race and Stefano Boldini had an amazing race, won the gold medal. I had an amazing race and be able to bring home the silver medal and the Lima winning, winning this bronze medal and coming like a flying eagle. It was just monumental. And dude, this, you know, I have to pinch myself because I went back to that seventh grade PE teacher, Coach Dick Lore saying, you're going to go to the Olympic. Not am I only going to my second Olympic, but I'm winning a medal for a country that has not happened since 1976, Frank Shorter. So it was just amazing time to be able to reflect and all the people that helped me to the steps uh, of my career in the uh, marathon, and my, which also I had a little bit of flashback of the, my New York City Marathon first one where I hit the wall. So I'm like, you know what, Paul Turgot is running. He's a 204 guy. Is he going to go into the bad shape and then go into the good phase? Is he going to catch up to us and things like that? So there was a lot of things going on, but it was such a, bless a pleasant time to be able to win a silver medal after you know, the great Frank Schroeder. So, Meb, so far it sounds like your running career is nothing but uh, good days and American records and Olympic medals and things like that. But, of course, we all know that uh, a career as long as yours hits obstacles along the way. And certainly in Beijing 2008, you wanted to go back and run like you did in Athens, maybe even better. 
Uh, but it didn't happen because in the marathon trials, you suffered a, a really nasty hip injury that afterwards you would describe barely being able to crawl around your house. Never mind walk or run. My question is, how do you go that low as you were in 2008 and fight back to the point where in just another year you can win the 2009 New York City Marathon? Emmy, that was a great question. And as a as a athlete, you always want to see, okay, if I can get silver and I can want to get gold, you want to be able to make better the next time. And especially Athens Olympics was my fourth marathon ever. And with, with experience, you get better in the marathon. At least that's what has happened in my career. And that's what most people preach about. So to uh, the 2007 November trials in conjunction for the 2000 New York City Marathon in Central Park it was a tough course around Central Park. I was the favorite to win by quite a bit, and I was sitting next to Ryan Shea, my good friend, on the starting bus to go to the, to the, to the starting line. And I remember just reflecting back, both of us talked about how wonderful it is to own the city of New York at 5.30 o'clock in the morning. And he remembered telling me Mumbai, Kenya, where he, the cross-country world, the US bus was not supposed to stop. And I remember telling him my first experience escort by police was in Brussels 10K and things like that. And then we got back to the zone of training, uh, racing. And Sometimes don't things don't plan out. That race, I visualize it. I wanted it to be my first win after finishing second in the Olympics, second in New York, third in Boston. I'm like, I'm ready for that one. When is going to come? But you don't always get what you think you deserve or you think you're going to get. And that was a disappointing. And uh, unfortunately, I was I pushed it hard. Ryan had, Hall had an amazing race. Nathan Rosenheim, Brian Sell. And, and then for me, it was like, okay, maybe I can be an alternate. Khalid Kanuchi was there. Maybe I can be second alternate. I would drag myself to that finish line. And I finished eighth, uh, eighth place. I ran 215 something. But then as soon as I finished, somebody told me a bad news and says, you know, what happened to Ryan? I'm like, I thought it was by Ryan Hall that he fell or slipped or something. He goes, Ryan Shea. He's like, what happened? He's like, oh, he passed away. And I just broke down. I just couldn't control, collapsed on the ground and I couldn't get back up. They picked me up and then they carried me to the taxi and then all that stuff. And then to your point, to your question is how do you come back over this? It gives life and perspective because here going to the Olympics, not a big deal after your good friend who you're sitting on the bus is no longer with us. So you kind of put it, hey, don't things for granted, work harder. But I remember my, my wife, Yordanos, and my bro brother, Howie, and Coach Larson. Coach Larson just said, hey, it's a good effort. You did a great job. It's been really nice working with you. So I'm like, what does this mean? Am I going to retire? That's not going to happen and things <laughs> like that. It was, and then I was crawling on my knees and elbows. I could not stand up. And people, the Sandra, Khalid Kunuchi's wife, Khalid Kunuchi, were trying to help me out because I, it was, I thought it was a spasm and things like that. I just, I couldn't put any weight. And it was 10 weeks later. Well, before that, I remember we prayed about it. I remember saying the silver medal. The 10K record, I'm okay with it. If that's what the end of my career is, God, I am okay with it. But I knew down deep internally there was more in the tank. And I just said, you know what? Ah, I can't wait another four years. New York City Marathon will be my Olympics. I remember telling that to my brothers and my wife. And we prayed about it. And then I was going wall to wall, holding place because I couldn't go just in the air. Just crawl to the where you can find a wall and then got up and then go a little bit. But that's... The mental aspect of it, you know, don't take for granted. It took me about a year and a half of physical therapy. There was a lot. I was I was misdiagnosed. Uh, the abdominal tear, I was scheduled to do surgery by my doctor, Dr. Steve Van Camp, and my wife wanted to get a second opinion. And then, of course, Dr. Luz Meher from New York figured out that I had pelvis stretch fracture. It was 10 weeks later that we realized I had pelvis stretch fracture. And, and uh, you know, due to the business of contracts, I rushed to try to come back for the 10K because if I don't make the the Olympic team in the 10K, I was going to get reduced by Nike. So it's like, oh, speed up, speed up. I got to be able to do it. And then it did more, even more damage. And that's why I think it took until a year and a half. And then 2009, to wear that red, white, and blue USA jersey, point out the USA jersey, my dream. I didn't go to the Olympics, but uh, Garib was there from silver medalist. And then James Combay, the fastest, second fastest guy in the world, was there. Robert Cheria was there, who was four-time Boston champion. I said, you know what? This can't get any deeper than this. And what a wonderful moment it was to be able to come across the finish line where my dream, my first victory was, where I started in New York City. So, Meg, uh, let, me, let me turn to a moment that hasn't uh, been discussed an awful lot. For several years, you didn't run the Boston Marathon because you and 
your brother and agent, Howie, felt the organization didn't respect you enough and uh, didn't offer enough appearance money. And I want to first clarify, is that right? And how did you resolve it? And for me, who's been around, you know, it's it's kind of shades of, of Frank Shorter back in 72 after winning the Olympics. And he didn't get airfare from Florida to, to Boston back then. There was no appearance money. And uh, he ended up not running the Boston Marathon, the Olympic champion. So tell us about your your story there with Boston. You know, for me, the Boston Marathon, even when I was at UCLA, people, I was a 5K, 10K run. People said, have you done the Boston Marathon? I mean, even before I bought a house in San Diego, I was thinking about the Boston Marathon because how people, many, many people discuss about it. Yes, I did the Boston Marathon. I finished third and it was a great outstanding finish. Very pleased. And then 2010, after I won the New York City Marathon, I really want to be win the Boston Marathon and I got that opportunity. But in 2011, uh, I think political got underway. And, you know, it was, I guess, it de they, they delayed it, they delayed it, they delayed it. And it was at the time with John Hancock, I uh, was a lead uh, 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 coordinator for that for the distance. And he just said, it's just wrong, it's just wrong. And then all the opportunities that I could have gone to London, other things did not happen. So because, and then in January, we got a small, very small offer. And, you know, and then, I that January I lost my Nike contract. It was constantly looked like they were working together to some extent, not to ha have me there possibly. So it was very tough. And I wrote a blog on it. I was, you know, you can invite who you want to invite, but at the same time, you know, it is challenging to be able to do that. So the political got in the way. But I remember how badly I wanted to win the Boston Marathon. I remember on New Year's Day, my wife and three kids, uh, two kids drive, uh, three kids driving. Two Mammoth Lakes on January 1st with the hope that I'd be invited to come to the Boston Marathon and hopefully we'll go for the win. But obviously that year was Jeffrey Mutai where he ran amazing 203. And, you know, you have Moses Mossop running 203, 06, and then Gabriel Gabriel, Gabriel Mariam, uh, and then also Ryan Hall running the fast time, the tailwind. And I'm like, people often ask me, where's your 205 or 206? I said, well... I wasn't in that race, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a tough to swallow. But at the same time, you know, I, we have differences. We have, I just, I respect the Boston Marathon so much, uh, the, the course, the distance, the people that have worked over there from years, but we have, we're on different page at that moment. And I feel, how do you overcome that? Those come that you just believe in yourself. I remember some people, you know, tell me, why don't you just come to the race and run it anyways and things like that. But, you know. At the end of the day, for me, it was also business decision. Uh, I was I thought I was worth more to the to the to the sport, and I didn't go and be able to come back from that. You know, I think how that was was 2012 Olympic Games when I finished fourth, and I was also the only American finish in that race that allowed me to be invited to the Boston Marathon in 2013. And obviously, you guys know what happened in 2013. I was there. I missed the bombing for by five minutes due to an appointment, and and I felt after four years, four hours of watching the race, I felt kind of I wanted to be able to come back and do it again. And then when I got invited in 2014, everything went pretty well. And you know, sometimes you take two step back and three step forward, and that's one of those things that were the situation we were faced at the time. Well, we're all certainly glad those conflicts uh, were resolved over the years at, at, at Boston. So you, you told us you were there in 2013. I think you didn't run. Maybe you were injured and you just missed the explosion. Tell us just briefly where you were and what your experience of the explosions was. And then were you ever scared after that? Did you think, geez, maybe I shouldn't come back to Boston Bad stuff happens here, and nobody can really protect marathoners for 52 miles both sides of the road. A lot of people were scared for a few minutes, and then something happened. What What was it like for you? You know, Andy, uh, I was scared more so when the 2004 Olympics happened, you know, and then, then I started running right in the middle of the road, I can, and then I have time to react in case something happens with the Lima situation when the ex-priest came. But in 2013... I was there for appearance uh, um, and and for sponsors. 
I met a lady that was that took her 22 years to qualify for the Boston Marathon, and I'm pretty sure she did not finish that day because she was on the older side, and I don't think she ran that fast before the before the bombing happened. But I remember I ran about eight miles or so that morning, and then I asked my brother how he to get me a pass to the grandstand because I, w- I was watching in the lobby the Fairmont Copley people want to ask questions. They want to do this. I'm like, I don't get the opportunity to see my fellow runner, follow runners finish. I want to go to the grandstand. I was there for four plus hours. In fact, the arch was closed. And I tell them, hey, you know, to be able to open it up to the volunteers because the, the Boston Marathon is the Olympics for the everyday athlete. And they want to get every second count, do the best they can. And they did listen to me. They opened it up. And then an hour before that, my appointment, I left the appointment. I left Howie there and many others. In fact, I was taking notes how the spirit of the marathon was and all those great things that brings us together. And I've walked, as you know, Ambie, uh, to the Fairmont Copley. That's how long, by the time I went to the lobby, the bombing, um, John Henka, somebody told me uh, the, the, there's a bombing. And I could say, how can that be possible? You know, there's no way there's thousands of people running. My brother is there. Everybody's there. My foundation, or everyone is there. How is it possible? I just threw the F-bomb. And was I scared to come back? I was not scared, but Bonnie Ford, who you guys know all from ESPN.com, she that evening asked me, are you scared? I said, I'm not scared, but are you planning to bring your family? Will, will you come back next year? I said, I hope to be healthy enough to win it for the people. So my first verbal saying, wanting to win the Boston Marathon was to her to say, hey, I want to be able to win it for the city. I want to win it for the people and for the sport of running. So, yes, I was uh you know, disappointed what happened, but then when the Red Sox, you know, that year when the Red Sox won and put the trophy at the finish line, I was getting massaged by my good friend Gary Ackman and Mamet. I said, I want to do that on Patriots Day for the runner. So there was constant dialogue. And when you see the Boston Strong slogan everywhere when I travel, I said, well, that's it. That's it. I got to do it. And then when you see the B hat, it just takes the emotion and just a constant reminder to rise to the occasion to be the best version of yourself. And Obviously, we can talk about 2014 and the comeback, but in 2013, I, I really badly wanted to do it. And I remember, in fact, I sent a text to Ryan Hall right after the men's finish. And I said, Ryan, this is within us. We can do this. And he said, we'll get after it. And so those were the things that the text we exchanged because we, Ryan Hall and I always believe that we can win New York. We can always win Boston. Well, you and Ryan certainly went after it a whole lot of times. Uh, Meb, I want to check with you. We've taken a few more minutes than we told you you would. That's only because your answers are so damn good. Are, are you okay for another 10 minutes? Absolutely. Good. So 2014, obviously, we got to talk about it. The thing that I think about is the night before you wrote four names on your bib, Martin, Crystal, Sean, and Lindsay, the four who died in 2013. That still gives me chills, and and I wonder how you had the nerve to do it, because what if you had had a bad day and dropped out? That wouldn't have been so cool. Amy, thanks for giving me chills still as you describe (laughs) it, because I remember talking to my wife uh, about it, and I wanted to have, uh, I'm a believer, both of us are believers, we wanted to have the cross and try to have the pictures on the four corners of the cross. And I said, how am I going to put it in my bib and then go and pull it out? I was not scared that I was going to have a bad race. I was determined to finish no matter what. My goal was to win top three or run a personal best. But what I was scared of was how the sponsor is going to react uh-huh. to me riding. I wanted to ride big, like, you know, my, my name, Meb. I wanted to put Sean, Martin, Crystal, Ling in a big way so people can see it. But then I'm like, that I got nervous about. I don't want to steer the pot, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> problem. So I decided to write it with a Sharpie instead of a big font, uh, font, fonts. But, you know, Mary Kay from, at the time, John Hancock, now with the BAA, when she saw that, it's like, what a brilliant idea. And she it went viral. And I'm like, I should have wrote bigger, you yeah. know. <laughs> so that was the thing that I uh, wanted to emphasize. But I was determined to go. And Ryan Hall and I talked in training. Like, this, this is going to be the like the Tour de France. It's going to be so much emotion, so many people coming. We're going to have to compose ourselves. But, I mean, it was inevitable, like, how massive people came to support, how electrifying it was, how they wrote the, uh, you know names or on the streets or posters and things like that and i just said you know what hold it hold it hold it and in fact the last thing i told my coach bob larson before 
going to, from the Korean church to the starting line, he was like, don't worry. Because he told me, he's like, he, you know, you can run 206, you can run 207 on this course. You're down on one leg, 209. And I said, don't worry, you're not going to see me until the last 5K of the race. And then, obviously, everything changed. I'm five miles into the race when the Kenyans and Ethiopians were trying to slow it down. I said, I'm, I'm going to go for it. Whatever happens, happens. And my goal is to win top three. And uh, person of best, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to go for it. And fortunately for me, you know, uh, just for a boy, my, uh, went at eight mile. I asked them, what happened? What are they? What are they doing? And, and I don't remember going to the halfway point. You know, athletes have been in the zone. Wesley, uh, Wesley College. I'm pretty sure you know, Ambi, there's a 13.1 there. At the half, I, both of us don't remember going to it, but then at about 13.9, I saw one of five something on my watch. And he said, you remember what our split was? He's like, no. I was like, anyways, Boston is about the title, not about the time, just fancy trade. And the rest is history. What a thrill of a lifetime it was to have people chant USA, USA, doing the wave as you run in. Man, I saw the only that in the track and field that was in Brussels, Memorial Van Dam, 10K. And that's what I felt like. People were just so enthusiastic to see an American in the lead. And, and for me, it was just push, make them earn it. They're going to catch you. They're going to they're gonna have to work hard to catch you. And fortunately, they didn't. And got close. I do a lot of visualization in my training. I visualized it came down to me and somebody else on Boylston Street. So when I saw 5K left, I saw somebody orange shirt on, on my right. And I'm like, save your energy, save energy. And then I'm like, no, you can't do that. Because if he gets up, catch up to you, he has a mental edge. So just keep pushing. I was looking back a lot, as some people might recollect, of me looking so many times was trying to engage if the gap got bigger or still the same. So that was my, uh, what I was looking back for. And, I would, you know, I had a long lead, but I got up to like six, seven seconds. It was uh, about a mile to go. And with one mile to go, that super sign couldn't come fast enough. And reading the book, reading about your book from you and uh, Bill Rogers and things like that, you know, about the Boston and stuff, it was awesome. And then that moment, I just said, you know what? Do it for the victims. Keep doing it. Give me the, give me the praying. Give me their spirit. Give me the angels and just drive me through what a thrill of a lifetime it was to make a ride on Hartford. And then for me, that was a sprint finish. Boston, I wanted to relax and get what I can. And then I just did the cross where the bombing happened and when I ch- made the churn and sent Chan USA, USA. What it was a disaster, a catastrophic moment for us in 2013. There was 36,000 other people running and the volunteers and the uh, people who came to support the spectators. It was such electrifying. I mean, I still get goosebumps that that time that I, you know, be able to be able to do the victory for all of us. Well, Meb, I'll tell you my story very quickly. I don't know if I've done this before, but I was I was close on your tail. I was only two hours behind you at halfway. And when I got to Wellesley, I was asking people, who won? Who won? Who won? And somebody said, Meb Kaplinski. And I'm like, oh, my God, you can't even tell the difference between Meb and the, the Kenyans and the Ethiopians. It couldn't have been <laughs> Meb Kaplinski who won this race. And, and yet you did it. And my question here is at the end when it really looked like you were going to get caught and yet you didn't because you were able to finish so strong. That seemed like incredible mental toughness. And In my day, we believed the marathon was only training in what you ate and drank. But now there's a whole lot of more people who are putting emphasis on the mental side of running. How important is that for you? It's a big component of it. Obviously, you got to do also the carbo load and uh, preparation, the work. But on race day, I always talk about my books, uh, 26 Marathons and Metro Myrtles. 90% is mental on race day. And for me, the reason I was able to hold the composure was mechanics. Mechanics and form. You know, the, doing the small things that make a big difference. You know, sometimes, why am I doing this at 7 p.m. and stretching or planks or sit-ups or weight training? Well, that came in handy that day. But you never, you know, you question it sometimes, sometimes. But then when it comes to the most important time, most important time to be able to come to the top of the of your occasion. And when the weight of your country is on your shoulder, you want to carry it as the strongest you can. I was in pain, MB. I was in such a tough time. But mechanics, mechanics pain and, and and mental you just if he was i remember when he got close if he was feeling good he would be next to me but he must be hurt it am i willing to hurt a little bit more than he is so those are the dialogue that you have and you know obviously you know coming to left on balls and i knew I, I had it but it's never over into the tape touch, touches the chest so i just said mechanics mechanic just you know and the police escort were if I accelerate, they're going to accelerate. If I did slow down, they're going to slow down. So I just said, keep using them, keep using them. What a thrill of a lifetime it was to be able to just 
become uh, the first American to win it in uh, in 31 years. And the Greg, Greg Myers, I remember who you know very well, tell me before the race, he always says, I don't want to be the last American to be in one who has won. He says, go get it done. You are a smart guy there. Get He told me that that morning. He said, go get it done. And I remember, and then when they announced, here's your 2014 Boston Marathon champion. And he was giving me a hug. And then it just, I just broke down and it, it hit me. And I was on this earth to have a purpose and it was to, to the sport of running. I feel very thankful to God for giving me looking at the heavens said, Hey, you can see that picture of my back. You know, that was, a, you know, just a beautiful moment for not only for me, but for my family, for Boston, for the sport of running and for the United States. A lot of people broke down that day, Meb, for all the best reasons. It was a beautiful day. It was a safe day. It was a joyous celebratory day. And a great American marathoner won the darn thing, which none of us actually expected or hoped for. Here's a simple, direct question. Did that 2014 Boston win change your life? Absolutely. That was a defining moment. Not that silver medal wasn't, not that the New York City Marathon, even when I won the New York City Marathon, I went to the Thanksgiving, Macy's Thanksgiving Parade, the David Letterman show, and and but the Boston victory is it was so much weight and on on the and on all of us. I just would not been fortunate enough to lead that thirty six thousand people and others. But it was monumental. How big monumental was is I mean for me it was my job. To, it was my dream to win. But when I got a call from President Barack Obama the next day, mm -hmm. I knew it was a big deal. And and when he said he made America proud and. Uh, job well done we're so proud of you and for him to invite me to the white house and i guess and i took my wife with me and have a dinner with the u.s and african leader summit that he hosts and to have president jimmy carter who was a passionate running uh cross-country runner and to, he said you know he's like i've been dying to meet you and things like that it was just a you know, uh, you know that changed my life forever and people you know I'll tell you a funny joke before we finish. So when we were in San Diego, some people come from Ohio and things like that. And they want to see me when I'm walking down to the old town or something. They would say hi and want to take a picture. And my daughters would say, I thought you told us not to say hi to strangers. Do you know the people? I said, I said no, I don't know them. But they know me because I won the Boston Marathon. I won the New York City Marathon. And I've been to the Olympic and things like that. So it's like, oh, you yeah, saying hi to strangers. It's okay. These are good strangers. It's hard to, to ask another question after one answer has ended with dinner at uh, the White House. But let's, let's skip to our final question here. So you can wrap things up. Uh, we'd like to give our guests uh, three fairy godmother wishes at the end of each podcast. That means wish for what you'd like to wish for, for yourself, for the Boston Marathon, for the Paris Olympics. Uh, what are three wishes that you'd like to see come come about in the next year or so? You know, the sports is such a, a fundamental for life. I wish uh, the, and, you know, the Olympics go smoothly for everybody. We may see the, the world united to do positive things. And also for those people that are struggling, you know, wars are tough. I came from that. You know, to, sometimes you hear this news and you're like, I'm not very controversial. I try not to be very controversial, but it doesn't mean that I don't feel it or sense it. Uh, and that's my wish. And for peace in the world to be the best version of self they can, you know, run to win. It doesn't necessarily mean to win a full race, but it means to get the best out of yourself. Whether you are on a podcast or the dinner and other things that in life that we have to make those decisions. So, and obviously I'm grateful and wishful for my family to have a blessed life. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, my oldest is 18, 16 and 14. Now they figure out life, what life has to offer. And wish everybody at the Boston Marathon and the running world the best of luck and have a healthy and strong finish. And for me, I just want to get that finish line as best as I can. Mentally, I think I'm okay, but physically, I haven't done this in six years. So I'm looking forward to going on April 15, 2004, to run the Boston Marathon for the Met Foundation. And that's a wrap for this week's podcast, Running State of the Sport. Meb, we can't thank you enough for joining us here today. And, you know, I'm hoping you have an even better run than you did in 2014. And, and you get to decide whether or not that's the case afterwards. But thank you so much for being here today. Amy and George, thank you for having me. Such a big fan of you guys and having me on the podcast. What a wonderful to be able to reflect back on my memory lane of my upbringing and my running. And so honored to be on your podcast. Thanks for having me.